That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Let's Scare Jessica to Death, a 1971 psychological horror film which is being re-released on Shout Factory's, well, their, their horror label Scream Factory, uh, on January 28th, 2020. Who directed this? John D. Hancock. Put your old Hancock on there. Mm. Uh, it's notably, he would go on to direct Prancer, the Christmas classic in 1989, starring Sam Elliott and Cloris Leachman. Classic, okay. Mm -hmm. Describe the plot. Uh, it, it's kind of a familiar plot. Uh, it's about a, a woman who's recently gone through some kind of psychological trauma. She's been released from some kind of sanitarium, and her and her husband and their friend uh, have relocated to a dilapidated apple orchard, an apple farm, uh, in the countryside, which they are going to renovate and live in. But it, it's uh, immediately apparent that uh, Jessica... There's a squatter. There is a squatter there, but it's immediately apparent that Jessica is not quite... Um, she hasn't been cured from her craziness. No. Yeah. No. Uh, which I think the film sets up quite well. I think the first half of the film is... Quite, I love the ambience of the film. Okay, but anyway, they show up to this house, there's a squatter. There's a squatter there, but they play it in a way that only Jessica sees her, and she's, should I say anything, or maybe I'm seeing things still, but of course the squatter is there. Um, and then uh, she invites the squatter to stay. It's a kind of, well, I guess you'd say a beautiful young woman. Sure. Uh, that uh, stays, and then uh, things devolve from there. Okay. So who plays the main... So the, the uh, lead is played by Zora Lampert, uh, who I feel is kind of an underrated actress. She had won an, She's done other things? She has done, yeah, plenty oh. of other things. Uh, she won an Emmy uh, two years after this film for uh, Kojak. Okay. And her last film was The Exorcist Three. Well, we should finish the story. So. Oh, oh, you want to go all the way? Well, might as well tell Okay. All. Okay, yeah, well... So the the squatter um, who is invited to stay turns out to be a vampire, kind of. It, it's it's set up in a way that makes it seem like she has always lived in this house, and this house used to belong to her family. And they learn from a local antique dealer that uh, when they try to sell goods from the, that are left inside the house, that this woman drowned, but they never found her body. And urban legend is she wanders the countryside as a vampire. Right. And the few locals they meet, who are really kind of like yokels, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they look all, all family <laughs> inbred, but they kind of, obviously there's something weird about the house they're occupying, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, she turns out to be uh, like somewhat of a vampire. It's like a mix of zombie vampires, the way it's set up. But, but it ends uh, in a way that makes it unclear as if this is still inside her head. Sure. So, what did you like about the film? I love Zora Lampert in this. I think she's, uh, she elicits immediate empathy. Uh, it's, even from the first few frames, it's like, oh, this woman has been through something. I love that there's, you hear the voices, she's talking to herself in her head, like, no, I can't say anything. Like, I, I love how it's set up. Yeah, her characterization uh, is really good. She seems very fragile. She's beautiful. Um, she has like a look in her eye, almost like she's always on the verge of tears. Yes, yeah. It's, so it, it, it definitely sets a, a really effective mood for what's to come. And, and while the acting, you know, this is a low budget film, this seems like something that um, Arrow Video should have put in one of their American Horror Project restorations. Um, but some of the acting is a little, you know. Well, but what else did you like? Um, her and the tone of the film, basically. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree. The story has potential, but I think mm, well, okay. what I didn't like, the weakest part of the film is the actual story because there's so much time spent focused on like whether or not Jessica is like, you know, about to go crazy again, that we ignore the fact that like the, sto the squatter is like a vampire. <laughs> right, right, right. So we don't really get introduced to that until like the last... Like 20 minutes. Like it, 20 it, minutes. it kind of rushes through the ending, to be fair. Um, but it, like the, as the title would indicate though, and as the setup, um, I kept thinking of something like Diabolique or Julien de Vivier's last film, Diabolically Yours, um, or even Joan Crawford's Straight Jacket, which these, these stories about these uh, people that have gone through trauma and then now are obviously being used in a way, like everybody around them is trying to make them crazy again. 
Sure. So it is a very familiar um, sort of plot point, like you said. So, you know, there are other films that do this better, but I do think sure. the lead actor, um, what's her name again? Zora Lampert. Yeah, she's, she's very watchable. Oh, and speaking of likes, I really like the scene where they all first sit down to dinner when they've invited the squatter, and she's kind of this hippie who starts singing a song and then her husband who's a mus musician uh, joins in and it it the soundtrack and everything and her kind of battling her thoughts at that moment including seeing that her husband is attracted to this woman I, I love that scene I think it's great well as in it's laughable no I think it was eerie I think it's I think it's melancholy and beautiful and, and encapsulates like her mental okay. state her fragile mental state I think it does a lot of things very well in that moment sure I'll be honest, I found it more amusing, like in a laughing at sort of way. <laughs> there are elements of the film that would suggest an MST3K treatment, perhaps. Oh, but, for sure. But but I, I don't know, I, I really, I like it. Uh, the, the husband, with his interesting hairline, uh, played by Barton Heyman, he was in The Exorcist, so we have two Exorcist franchise connections. Okay. But he kept reminding me, he made me so uncomfortable because he was reminding me of Paul Masterson from The Stepford Wives. The husband in that, okay. kind of this melt-toast white man who's making these terrible decisions for his wife because he even he's frustrated with her because it's clear she's not well and he suggests she goes back to New York to see her doctor. And I think you and I were talking while watching it about how <clears throat> in the people used to think that oh people just need a fresh air, a change of pace, new scenery. It's like no, she needs therapy still. Yeah. Um, it also feels a little time. It doesn't feel like 1971 to me per se. Like it feels a little more advanced than some of the like B genre films from that period, because we were just watching a film from 1990 the other day, Deadly Manor, and you were surprised that that was 19. I th that this felt more contemporary than that film. Okay. Um, it was lens by uh, Robert M. Baldwin, who uh, would do some other notable films. His last film was McBain in 1991, uh, which starred Christopher Walken, and he also did Frankenhooker, the Hen and Lauder film. That's kind of a lot of fun from 1990. Okay. So what would you give this film? I would give this film a three out of five stars. I would give it two and a half out of five. Okay. It's worth watching. For I, sure. I, I, I think just for the I mean, I remember the woman whose name I can't remember. Zora Lampert. <laughs> yes. I remember this film as a kid. I saw this as a kid on cable because it was one of those films that played on, I don't know if it was like the Sci-Fi Channel or TNT or TBS, but I, I really enjoyed re-watching it because it has uh, an eeriness to it that I think is that does stay with you. And right. I would give the, the disc, this new Blu-ray uh, disc release, uh, also three out of five. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.